Luke chapter 19. Read the story of Zacchaeus. Now don't get quiet on me, okay? Quiet church is a dead church, and we are not dead. So just, just get involved. Are the Seahawks not making some great acquisitions, or is that just me? This feels good, man. This is, you could just close in prayer right there. So good. Luke 19 and verse 1. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was vertically challenged. So he ran ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Now, for those of you that grew up in church, every time I read Luke 19.4, I hear the song. Climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. Every time I read that verse, the song goes through my head. It's hard to resist, obviously. Okay. Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. And saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. So Zacchaeus made haste, came down and received him joyfully. Look how pumped Zacchaeus is. But when they, the other Jews that were there following Jesus, observing Jesus, saw this, they all complained saying, he's gone to be guest with a man who is a sinner. That word sinner is a, it is a derogatory term. In our like, modern vernacular, it would be like calling someone a dog, a beast, an outcast, a reject. It's literally, I mean, this is more of a, it's kind of translated in a G format, but it's more PG-13. Um, this, is, this, is, this is a really mean term that they're using to describe Zacchaeus. They clearly do not like him and do not like the fact that Jesus is befriending him. And it says now, verse 8, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Isn't that beautiful? Now go with me to just a, three more verses. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8. Romans chapter 5. It reads, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. What a phrase. Jesus died for the ungodly. Paul goes on to write, the writer of Romans, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps maybe for a pretty good guy, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we're still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Those three little verses will change your life if you let them. Man, that is Amazing. It's the good news, isn't it? Well, if you're new to church and new to this experience, we're Bible people. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. And I'm going to take about the next 30 minutes, and we're just going to kind of expound and consider the person of Jesus from the pages of this ancient book. And I pray that you'll be really encouraged. And more importantly, I pray that you'd experience the love of Jesus today. Amen? Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for this book. What a privilege and what an honor it is, Lord, to to be here and to know you. And for those, of God, that are seeking and searching even today, I pray they would truly experience you. Help us to see your beauty and your majesty and your grace. We thank you for it, love. Lord, thank you for your love. And thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that's amongst us. And thank you that Sacramento doesn't have enough money. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm not enough, regardless of my intentions. There are too many things missing in my life. In other ways, 
There are too many things cluttering my life. Don't you have to be perfect first? Aren't there rules about this? I'm sure anyone else is more worthy of this than I am. I want to be accepted, but I'm not deserving of love. Nobody would love me in my current state. I'm too broken. Too many things need to be fixed first. I want to walk away. I want to change. I want to give up the emptiness of my life. First, I need to make it all right. But how? We've been um, listening to this young lady think out loud starting last week and today. And then, of course, the next couple of weeks, we'll do the same. She seems to articulate out loud what nearly all of us, in fact, I'm sure of it, all of us have thought a time or two. The social setting in society that you and I function in functions exactly the way that she's expressing. We, before there is acceptance or belonging or befriending, there has to be some adherence to some codes of conduct. Most of us have this thought, well, first, first, I need to make things right. First, I need to get <clears throat> my ducks in a row. First, I need to clean up my life a little bit. The truth is, many people didn't come to church today because of this premise. I'm not going to go to church. I haven't. First, I need to make things right. Then I'll go to. This isn't. Uh, profound. This is much of how our planet functions and operates socially, relationally. This is how we work. Um, and uh, some of us are very, very busy ensuring that nobody sees parts of us that may disqualify us from relationship or acceptance. This is how most of us, or whether we're willing to, not, uh, I shouldn't say most, I should say all of us function this way, whether we're willing to admit it or not. Uh, let, me, let, let me explain. Have you ever had uh, someone come over to your place uh, unexpectedly or last minute? Your, your, your condo, your house, your place. Has that, has that, has that ever happened to you? Uh, you, you? It's kind of unexpected. Maybe a friend of yours coming to town and they're like, hey, we're here. We're on our way over. Or, or better yet, you're a married couple and, and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're out and about and your spouse is at home and you run into the out-of-town couple who came looking for you and are so excited about coming over right now in this moment and they say, hey, could we get a ride with you or we'll follow you home. Your spouse is at home. Now, in this moment, you will discover the difference between a veteran husband or wife or a rookie. This is it. This is what it comes down to right here. For a decade, friends, I never gave a heads up phone call. I ran into my friends. They wanted to come over. I said, great. And we showed up. Ten years I did that. I'm a slow learner. Thirteen years later, I'm a veteran. And I know that you have to make the code call. When you have unexpected guests en route to your place of habitation, you must forewarn, particularly your wife. Okay? So this is what, especially when they're in the car with you, you make the code call. Hey, babe, it's me. She's wondering, why are you calling me identifying yourself? <laughs> it's me. I'm with Jim and Sarah. They're in town. They're coming over with me right now. <laughs> On the other line, your wife, your spouse is saying something to the effect of what? This is ridiculous. No, I don't want them. The house is a wreck. Are you serious? I know, babe. Me too. Totally. She's so excited you guys are here. Okay, babe. See you in a few. She's not excited. She's exasperated. 
And what's happening at home is total chaos. She is frantically running the hallways of our house, shoving stuff in every cabinet, corner, and closet. If it's out of sight, it's in play. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, we got half-eaten bowls of cereal in the kids' closets. It's whatever it takes. So by the time we cross over the threshold of our front door with our good friends Jim and Sarah, Jim and Sarah, we walk in, we got Kenny G playing in the background, we got a candle lit, and Chelsea's in an apron, I didn't even know she had an apron. She's like, oh my gosh, Jim, Sarah, what a surprise. I was just baking. I'm like, ba- babe, you never bake. <laughs> yeah, she bakes every Saturday night. They're like, we all do it, right? And first of all, while we're on topic, why are, why are we all pretending? Why do we keep doing this to each other? We're supposed to be friends. You know what I want to tell Jim and Sarah? You're a real big inconvenience right now. My wife's at home and she wants to be romantic, if you know what I mean. Now she just put on sweats. Could you guys go away? I don't want you to come over. I don't want you to stay for the weekend. I don't want to have to pick up my underwear from the bathroom floor. Go away, Jim. This is Jim, actually, right here on the front row. I don't, I don't mean that to you, Jim. I love you. And his wife's name is Sarah. So that's awkward. But the true story. I used the illustration last service. I'm sticking with it, okay? Can, like, can't we all just be honest with each other? Like, look, my wife's freaking out. Um, our house is a wreck. That's how we normally live. But when you guys come over, we pretend, you know? Like, we're perfect. I don't know what's under the surface. I don't know what's under the hood that makes us kind of like all do this. Like these are some of our dear friends, but yet we want to pick up for them. Like for family members, like extended family come over and we're like, okay, kids, shove everything out of sight. Awesome. Light candles, spray stuff in the air. Let's pretend like we always smell good and everything looks good. Is it, is it perception? Is it, or is it really get back to what we started talking about, how our social structure is set up. How we, you know, if, if, if they discover that we're hoarders and we're sloppy, maybe they won't accept us. If they find out that we smell, maybe they won't like us. It, we're, we're funny little creatures, but this is much of how we conduct ourselves. All the more ridiculously and ironically is that we function this way with God. That we actually think that if in the nick of time we shove our stuff in every closet, corner, and cabinet possible of our heart, our soul, and our life, that God possibly perchance might come over to our place and stay. (laughs) Okay. You know that God knows, right? Like He knows everything. He knows all the closets, all the cabinets, all the corners, all the nooks, and all the crannies. He made them, he knows them, and he knows what's in them. But we're busy, aren't we? I mean, it's so funny, it's such a simple metaphor and illustration, but how many of us right now in this moment are busy stuffing stuff out of God's sight, or so we think? Because that'll help God love me. But in fact, God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus so that we can put to rest these silly notions and really fully understand who he is and how he functions. Now, the reason Jesus drove people nuts in some settings is because socially he acted totally different than a normal human being. And it bugged people all the time, all the time. Last week we talked about Luke 15. The Luke 15 narrative, the whole like the three little stories of the shepherd and, and the lady with the coins and, and the, the sons, that's all an explanation because people were complaining how Jesus was acting socially. They didn't like who he interacted with. They didn't like who he was befriending. So they complained. Well, guess what? This week we got another complaint. And they're complaining again, Jesus, you... <laughs> You hang out with rejects 
and dogs. You know how sloppy and messy and disorganized these people are? What is wrong with you? This is not how the social structure has been set up. You keep ruining our system. Play along. But God, see, here's the thing about God. God acts on his own. Now that may seem very simple to you, but you've never done that. We always, there's always, it's, no matter how isolated we are, there's always something in the back of our mind that thinks... If I post this photo, how many likes will I get? When I tweet this, will anybody RT me? Retweet me? How many friends do I have on Facebook? What's on MySpace? I forget. Is it friends? Is it buddies? Is it anyone on MySpace anymore? Okay. Anyways, (laughs) like God never has those thoughts. Like God would never send a tweet and go, ah, did I say that right? Was that photo, was that too much? Was it, you know? Did it make the popular page? He acts, listen, he acts on his own. One old school preacher said, God is God all by himself. He don't need anybody else. That's true. He's totally his own. He is the ultimate independent being. He is sufficient within himself. He has no needs. Now, he wants you, but he doesn't need you. He acts on his own. And that's what Romans teaches us, does it not? Romans chapter 5. It talks about how Christ died for the ungodly. And then Paul says, now, in this social structure and setting, you can barely find somebody who'll die for somebody who's really good. And perhaps maybe you'll find one or two people ever in your lifetime who will die for someone who's pretty good. But God demonstrates his own love. It's his own. He is the exclusive source and owner of this kind of love. It's called agape. It only comes, it's divine love, it's God love. It needs absolutely no reciprocation. It needs no likes, it needs no retweets. It's agape. He extends it because of himself, not because of you or anybody else or me. It's him and him alone and him and him alone moves him. So God demonstrates his own love toward us, and I'll prove that this is true, in that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, he acts on his own. He sends his son, allows his son to be crushed with no guarantee of reciprocation or acceptance. You want to understand God? Romans 5, 6, 7, 8 will unpack it pretty profoundly. And I might add, that God allowed his son to take all the sins of all humans that will ever be lived, those who will accept him and those who will reject him. Now be careful now. We're about to venture into, we use vernacular and adjectives such as awesome, amazing, incredible to describe God. We might move into another level here where you describe God as illogical, ridiculous, and then use words like, huh? What? I want you to understand this, church. God allowed his son, Jesus, God in the flesh, to take on his body the sins of people who would never even accept his substitute sacrifice. That doesn't make any sense. Why inflict extra pain on yourself when you have foreknowledge? Remember God? He has foreknowledge. He knows who's going to reject him and who's going to accept him. And while we're on topic, why love people who you know will never love you back? Because he acts on his own. Because he acts all by himself. I mean, I look at that and go, this is, this, is, this is dumb. This is not necessary. This is too much. You're going to experience extraordinary additional extra pain For people who will never access your substitute? Why? Only one answer. Because he acts on his own. Because of who he is. So Jesus comes to the planet to answer. People today still are going, I wonder who Jesus would hang out with. Or better yet, I wonder who God would be friends with. We know because of Jesus. 
I, like, I, wonder, I wonder like if, if God attended city church. Like, who, who would he, like, what would he, what would he be like? You don't have to ask. We got an answer. Jesus has demonstrated God for us in living color. Missed that show. But it, it, sorry, my brain needs medicine. But we can put some of these things to rest. Who would Jesus hang out with? Well, Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 really begin to help us understand why Jesus seeks after and pursues a relationship with a guy like Zacchaeus. Now, before we go any further, let's describe a little bit of who Zacchaeus really is. Okay? Because here's what we do over a process of time in, in Christianity and in, in, in church life. We, we take characters like Zacchaeus and we kind of insulate them a little bit. We put a little like soft padding and foam around who they really were. And we kind of round off their rug, rugged edges. And we kind of make them like, you know, just kind of people that are down on their luck. You know, Zacchaeus, he was, he was a poor soul. Oh, I kind of feel bad for little Zach. Don't feel bad for little Zach. We kind of think Jesus was, Jesus was compassionate to people who were maligned and beaten and abused. Wait a minute. Zacchaeus is the guy who does the maligning, does the abusing, and does the belittling. He's that guy. He hurts kids, families, and little old ladies. This is a bad guy. Please don't feel bad for Zach. Zach doesn't feel bad for himself. Okay? He's short, but he's made up, made, made up for it with a big bank account. Okay? Zach has multiple girlfriends. Okay? Zach is living the life. And I do not think that Zacchaeus is thinking to himself, Oh, ooh, 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 Jesus is coming by. I hope he saves me from my sins. Zacchaeus would be like, Save me from what? My big house with a view? Hello? I run these streets. These people fear me. And I'm short. I don't think Zacchaeus came into our scene today thinking, Oh, I'm so, I'm so down on life and luck. Help me, help me. I'm in rock bottom. He's living the life, friends. He is a thug. He's an ancient drug lord, if you will. He is a Jew cheating Jews out of their money for Rome. He's a dog by definition for a proper Jew. He is the worst of the worst. He's an outcast. They literally would not allow him in the synagogue. He was not allowed in their place of worship. He is officially out of God's will. And by will, I mean any blessing or inheritance. He's no longer a part. He's an official reject. Okay, So just so you know, Zacchaeus is not like a poor little soul. And this out of everyone present, how many wonderful, kind Jews does Jesus have to choose from in this scene? And he chooses that guy? The Bible says that Jesus is coming through the town. He's outside Jericho. Evidently, this is kind of Zacchaeus' hood. These are his streets. Now, keep in mind, Zacchaeus is not a tax collector. He's not an assistant tax collector. He's not a manager of tax collectors. He is a chief tax collector. He's got tax collectors working for tax collectors, working for tax collectors, and he's getting a cut. Okay? He is in charge. How long has he been doing this? Longer than a few years. We know that. Jesus is coming through his hood, and I think he's curious. He would have grown up being taught the Torah. He would have heard the prophecies of the soon coming Messiah. This seems to be one of the leading candidates in recent history for the Messiahship. And so he's thinking, I want to check this guy out. Problem, he's short. He's always pretty good on his feet. So he runs ahead and climbs a tree because he wants to check Jesus out. Jesus had other plans that day. To Zacchaeus' shock, and probably in his mind, his complete luck, this man Jesus stops directly under the very tree Zacchaeus chose. Zacchaeus probably has thoughts some, similar to this. I'm brilliant. I choose the one tree the guy stops under. I'm amazing. 
Or maybe Zacchaeus thinks when Jesus addresses him, he must have seen my ingenious climbing. I mean, anybody else climbing trees? No, but I did. He must be impressed by my climbing. Now, I want to stop and use as a metaphor to talk to Christians. Zacchaeus is not a Christian at this point, but let me speak to Christians. We do a lot, a lot similar to Zacchaeus here. Many of us are still living under the premise that if I will climb a big enough tree and get high enough, God will stop under my tree because he'll be so impressed. Like God's going to stop and go, wow, Zacchaeus, you are six feet off the ground. Whoa. Wow. You prayed 37 minutes this morning. I'm stopping by your tree, little slugger. Wow. You've been to church four weeks in a row. That's a whole month. Woo! Wow, you, 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 give, you gave 22% of your income this year. Never in all of eternity have I seen. But we still believe it. We can prove it by our lifestyle. We still think the crazy, dedicated few climbers are the ones that will be recognized and the ones that will be honored. If I will climb the proverbial tree of devotion and discipline and dedication and focus and spiritual principles, and if I'll adhere to it and I'll memorize scripture and I'll tithe and I'll be good in my church attendance and I'll be nice to little old ladies and I'll be a kind person and a good person and a holy person and a righteous person, then God will stop at my tree and he'll invite me into his life. That, that's what I'm, I'm going to keep climbing. And if we're not careful, we get together as churches and we encourage each other on the climb. Keep climbing. But I'm not blessed. You keep climb higher, you'll get blessed. Yeah, but my kids, they're not, they're not doing good. Well, you gotta climb faster, higher. Okay. We got Christians living like Swiss family Robinson. You got your whole family living up in trees. Trying to do better and try harder and be different and be holy and be good. And we're not going to be like all those people down there. We're going to be better. Come on, kids, everybody. We've got family members falling out of the treehouse because they're tired. This metaphor is getting out of control. <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> I feel like the Holy Spirit just said something to me and I hope that, you know, these two words, what Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I pray will ring true for decades in this community. What does Jesus say to Zacchaeus? He says to us today, as Jesus followers, come down. And by the way, hurry, come down, come down from trusting yourself. Come down from trusting your abilities. Come down from trusting your giftings and your devotion and your acts and your good deeds. Come down. All of humanity plays on a level playing field and there is only one answer and one antidote and his name is Jesus. Let's all just come down. That's good news, isn't it? You just stop acting spiritual and just be spiritual and love Jesus. Go ahead and just feel free to come on down. It's about time some of us just stop and say, all right, the truth is I got towels in the tub. I got dishes in the closet. Okay, we don't bake around here. I don't even like Kenny G's music. I'm a work in progress. I got issues like you. What if we build a whole community around people who are committed to continually coming down and realizing we all need Jesus? Come on. That's another message, but it's a good one. Jesus has come down. And you know what's amazing about this passage is how pumped Zacchaeus is. He's so pumped. It says, I mean, he hurries down that little tree like a chipmunk. It says he makes haste. You know, he's just, just a little man, just so pumped. And he gets down there, and the Bible says he receives Jesus joyfully. Like, what does that look like? It looks like he's pumped, and he's probably putting his arm around Jesus. He's probably putting his arm around Jesus, and he is just like, he's just like, this is amazing. Now, I saw this, and I thought, in the repentance process, 
should Jesus like tell Zacchaeus, hey, don't be happy. You're a crook. You're a thug. Where's your godly sorrow, little man? I've done this. Won't you come into church all happy-go-lucky, honky-dory? You got a divorce a week ago. You better come in here morbid and sad, groveling over your failure. Because that'll, that'll help. I don't know exactly why, but I just think it will. Hey, you're addicted. Don't come in church like you're not addicted. Don't come in here happy. You need to be sad for your addiction. You need to come in here in sackcloth and ashes. If you don't know what that is, it's a reference to the Old Testament. You need to, you need to be really, really sorry. That's weird. Zacchaeus is pumped. And Jesus seems to be okay with his pumpness. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you kind of like, you know, Zacchaeus, tone it down a little bit, okay? Tone it down, all right? You're not a good guy. Oh, sorry. But it's like Jesus and him just walk like, you know, arm in arm. And every step they take, they tick off another two. And all of us are like, oh, isn't it beautiful how Jesus loves Zacchaeus? Except if you were actually there in attendance and you weren't Zacchaeus. Hey! Come on! They're laughing? You think how he stole my grandma's pension is funny? Why are you laughing? And he's going up to his house on the hill. He cheated our family to pay for that infinity pool. What does Jesus... See how socially he just frustrated people? He doesn't even explain himself. Guys, I'm a missionary. I'm on a mission. I'll change him. Pray for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that would have been helpful. Give us a little context. But it seems like they're just going up there to like, you know, have grapes and sit in the hot tub. And then it happens, you know. Then it all happens. Between verses 7 and 8 of Luke 19, it happens. Everything changes for our little thug. Everything changes. He goes, we see the complaining crowd, and the next scene we're privy to is probably, safe to make some assumptions here, their home. Jesus said, I need to come to your house. They're at Zacchaeus' house now. They're probably around a banquet table, probably some colorful pillows they're reclining on. And Zacchaeus steps up, probably dings his wine glass, and says, I have an announcement to make. And what he proceeds to say is absolutely shocking. He stands up and he's probably got some co-workers there and his managers, his crew, his ladies, they're all probably there. And, he's, and he says, I have an announcement to make. Um, first of all, Lord, he just called the man sitting next to him at his table in his dining room. He just called him God. He looks like a normal man. But Zacchaeus is convinced now, this is God. God of the universe. Clearly faith is bursting inside of Zacchaeus. He says, you're God. First of all, you're God. And because you're God and I met you, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore fourfold. Translation. Zacchaeus just stood up because of one dinner with Jesus. How long do they eat? An hour? Two hours? Three hours? Four hours? We don't know exactly. But all I know is those moments with God in the flesh led Zacchaeus to essentially say, I'm out. I'm done. I'm changing everything. One day, one moment, one evening, one afternoon with Jesus. And thousands of years the law couldn't accomplish that. But when you met the man who fulfilled the law and embodies all the principles and ethics and concepts of Scripture, all in physical form, when Zacchaeus met a man, not a mantra, 
not tablets of stone, not tens, do's, and don'ts, but when he met a man, everything changed. He gave up everything. He commits to, I think he probably didn't even have enough money to do everything he just said, which tells me I'm going to give everything away. Anything more that I make, I'm going to keep giving that away. He just got out. His whole livelihood, he just gave up. His reputation, his relationships, everything. He just said, I'm done. No, no, no. Some have said, now, Jude, don't you think we need to be careful? Maybe you've said this in your heart and maybe you've thought these things. And I think they're notable and I think they're worthy. Hey, are we getting a little bit carried away? You know, God is good and his grace and his love and Jesus. And, you know, are we... Are, I'm going to talk about ethics and morals and principles, all of which Paul spends much time on. And obviously they have their place and they are helpful. But Judah, don't you think, when are we going to train people and equip people? And, you know, what about holiness? What about morality, purity? Are, are we going to, don't you think we need to talk about these things? We just keep pointing to Jesus. Is that a, is that enough? Is that? And and I think that's an honest question, by the way. I think that's thoughts that a a real genuine believer is probably going to have. But I'd like to answer it right here for you. There's my take on it. Leviticus 5, 6, under the law, demands that Zacchaeus, when he recognizes God and his wrong and what he's done, Zacchaeus is required under the Levitical law to restore 100% of what he stole. He embezzled it, friends. Okay? 100% plus one-fifth, 20%. So what Zacchaeus is bound to under the law is 120%. But if you go back to our passage, what Zacchaeus committed to was 400%. Zacchaeus eclipsed the demands of the law by 280%. Why? Because he met a person. Not a principle. Not a concept. Not just a community, not a function, not a hobby, not a get-together, not a social setting, not a club. He met a man. And that man changed everything. And I don't think Zacchaeus had even the, a moment of thought about the law. By this time, it wasn't just Ten Commandments. It was over 200 laws that the Jews were to adhere to. Zacchaeus wasn't thinking about the law. He was thinking about love. And love motivated him to do what the law could never motivate him to do. No manipulation, no coercion, no great teaching of ethics and do-goodism and good deeds or self-help could change this man's life. But one moment with Jesus, when he looked in those eyes that burned with compassion and mercy and love, He changed everything and eclipsed the law by 280%. Am I for morality? Am I for holiness? Is City Church about living holy lives and having good marriages and raising our kids right and giving generously and living this lifestyle absolutely with all of our heart? But you don't get that unless you focus on the man Jesus Christ. And when you think love and not law, the life you live, you only dream possible this is our passion I believe in tithing and I believe in giving let's just talk about percentages for a moment tithe means 10% I believe in that Matthew 23 23 Jesus said do it but do you know why Jesus didn't take a long time to talk about tithing because it's never been about percentages it's about a person I'm not going to demand you give 10%. God might ask you to give 90. Yeah. Jude, is this sermon about money? It's about your heart. And the Bible says where your money is, your heart's going to be right there. So just let me pastorally make an application to our community and to our life. If you're a guest, you can put your, I was going to say put your Walkman on. Nobody has this anymore. Put your headphones on. But let me just talk to you as your pastor. This is, I, I don't I don't want to get hung up on percentages and mere principles when we have the person. 
And can I just say in a few moments, what we're going to do is we always do, we're going to give and our hosts who are amazing servants are going to come and they're going to pass buckets. And sometimes I wonder, should I even pass buckets anymore? Because if it's a bucket that reminds you or manipulates you or co- coerces you into giving, please don't give. Somehow I just kind of hope like if, if our parking lot was pure mud and we had one little lonely bucket from Home Depot that was collecting the resources that we were donating for the missions that were on here at City Church, I pray because the person of Jesus is so real to you that if you had to get on your hands and knees and trudge through the mud in pouring rain in Seattle, Washington to give resources in one lonely little orange bucket from Home Depot, you would do it because you've met a man and he's changed your life through and through. all about him and when we see him and experience him and enjoy him our life changes listen to me dramatically dramatically and somewhere somebody's going to say how'd you do it you know I'm sorry I've added up what you've given your marriage your kids And your response will be something like, I wasn't keeping track. I wasn't keeping my spiritual stats. I'm just in love. And before I knew it, I guess I did give that. I guess our marriage did last. I guess my kids are doing pretty good. But I just, my life is the overflow of love that I have for the man who risked time at my table. And loved me when I had been rejected by everybody I knew. Who's Zacchaeus? I'm Zacchaeus. You're Zacchaeus. For all have fallen short. Zacchaeus' stature is our stature spiritually. But he loves us, doesn't he? He chooses us. This is the message that is ours to share with the world. There's a God whose love is so vast and so expansive and so incredible and so indescribable. It can reach, love, care, deliver, save anyone, anywhere, at any time. Come on, church. Let me pray for you. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. I just sense God's extraordinary love and and His presence, you know, His goodness in this room. I just want to pray for some people. If you're here under the sound of my voice or you're there at Alderwood or Belltown or U District and you'd say, hey, I am like Zacchaeus. I want to call Jesus God. I want to call Him Lord. I want to accept Him and follow Him forever. He loves you. He's for you. Now it's our privilege to choose him and accept him. If you're here and you say, I want to become a follower of Jesus Christ, you to please include me in your closing prayer. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, I'm going to ask you to shoot up your hand just between you and God. Nobody's looking around. But if that's you, when I get to three, would you shoot up your hand all over the city at all of our campuses? One, two, three. Just shoot up your hand real quick. Come on. Awesome. Dozens, dozens of hands. That's awesome. He's a good God. And he loves you so much. Anybody else all over the city, just lift up your hand and I'm going to include you in this prayer. Come on, church. Everybody, would you pray this simple, simple prayer with me right out loud? Lord Jesus, here's my life. It's yours. I love you because you love me. You first love me. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for taking my sins on the cross. I love you. Amen.